So then the professor, still sticking to temperatures, says that my temperature uh, record doesn't accord with that of NASA. And he produces the NASA GIS temperature record, which you see on his slide, which I'm showing you now. Now, in fact, you can see that that temperature record jiggles up and down in really very much the same way. It only starts in 1880 rather than 1850, but it jiggles up and down in much the same way as the NCDC, the um, Hadley Center's data, which is the one that I was actually using. The two are not quite interchangeable, but they're clearly showing more or less the same temperature trends. And I want to know this, Professor. What is the reason why you think that the NASA GIS record is credible and the Hadley CIU record, which I used, is not a credible data set? And the reason why I ask that is that it is not the NASA data set that the IPCC uses. It uses the same one I use, the Hadley Center CIU data set. And the next point he goes on to, and we'll flow straight on from this, is he starts talking about the fact that, very briefly, in passing, I mentioned that the head of the IPCC that uses the Hadley Center data set that he doesn't like, I mentioned that the head of the IPCC's climate science panel, is he a climate scientist? Is he a meteorologist? Is he even a mathematician? or physicist, or oceanographer, or one of any number of sciences that might have something to do with the climate. No, he's a railroad engineer. Now, would you appoint a railroad engineer to be the head of a climate science panel and expect that panel to get anything right? Well, it personally wouldn't be my first choice. Now, let's be fair to Dr. Pachori. He is also an economist. But again, the sections of the IPCC that are dealing with economics are the working groups two on mitigation, that's what will be the economic effects of slowing down the rate at which we emit CO2, and working group three on adaptation, which is supposing there are any climate changes as a result of what we're doing, how do we adapt to them and what it's going to cost? If he had been chairman of Working Group 2 or Working Group 3, then although his experience as a railroad engineer would still not be relevant, arguably his experience as an economist would. So let's be fair to him and say that. But he's not the chairman of Working Groups 2 or 3. He's the chairman of Working Group 1, which has nothing to do with economics and certainly nothing to do with railroad engineering. It has everything to do with climate science, about which poor Dr. Pachori knows absolutely nothing. And I've sat through lectures by Dr. Pachori, and it is a painful experience. And I'm going to give you just one little example of that. I went to Copenhagen in December 2009, and Dr. Pachori gave a lecture at the University of Copenhagen about the results of Working Group 1, of which he is the chairman, of the IPCC, the UN's Climate Science Panel. The first thing he asked us to believe was that the IPCC's documents were peer-reviewed. He then admitted in the very next sentence that it was the authors of those documents that had the final say in what went in and what didn't. Well, whatever that is, it's not peer review. If you write an article for a peer reviewed journal, as I have done, then what happens is the peer review editor gets onto you and he says, the reviewers, or in some case the review editor himself, it depends on who does it, uh, want you to make the following changes. And if you don't make those changes, it's no good you saying you want the article published anyway. We won't publish it. That's how peer review works. That's not how the IPCC does it. It's one of the many reasons why the IPCC is an unsuitable vehicle for doing climate change research. So then Pachori said that greenhouse gases had increased by 70% between 1970 and 2004. Well, they simply hadn't. That's a wild and enormous exaggeration. He went on, guess what, to use the bogus graph trying to show that temperatures are accelerating so that we're getting ever faster 
rates of warming. We'll show that graph again here, so you're just reminded that that was the IPCC's graph. And that was a graph about which I had spoken to Pachori only a few minutes earlier, saying, don't use that graph again, it is defective. And he used it anyway. Then he said there'd been an acceleration in sea level rise from 1993. Well, interestingly, a slide which we'll now show you from the presentation by Professor Abraham shows perfectly well that there's been no acceleration in sea level rise from 1993. The only reason for thinking there has been is that there was a change in the method of data collection from tide gauges to satellites in 1993. And the satellites did appear to show uh, though the difference has since been largely resolved, a slightly greater rate of sea level rise than the tide gauges has shown. But the idea that this is an anthropogenic effect has absolutely no basis in fact, but Pachori wouldn't know that. He said that Arctic temperatures would rise twice as fast as global temperatures over the next hundred years, but he failed to point out that the Arctic was actually one to two Celsius degrees warmer than the present in the 1930s and 1940s. It's become substantially cooler now than it was then. And what does that tell you, Dr. Pachori? It should tell you that the Arctic climate is highly volatile. It changes a lot for reasons which are well understood in climatology, but presumably not well understood in railroad engineering. Then Pachori said the frequency of heavy rainfall had increased. But the evidence for that proposition is largely anecdotal. There is no reliable measurement of precipitation worldwide that would allow us to formulate that view at the moment. And besides, there hasn't been any statistically significant global warming for 15 years, or there certainly hadn't at the time I gave my talk. And therefore, if there were any increased rainfall in recent years, whatever else caused it, it wasn't global warming because there hadn't been any. This is the kind of boring, logical approach that a proper scientist, when looking at climate scientists, would take. Then Pachori said, the proportion of tropical cyclones that are high-intensity storms has increased in the past three decades. However, he was very careful not to point out that the total number of intense tropical cyclones has actually fallen sharply throughout the period. And also, taking the past three decades, a trick which I shall show you later on, which is done by uh, a scientist I in a learned paper which got peer-reviewed, how he got through, I don't know. That's a bogus trick. You have to take the longest run of data that you can. That's something which Professor Abraham is always reminding us of. And if you go back to, 90, to the 1940s, when the first records of these things were kept, you find there's been no trend in uh, the Atlantic hurricanes in that time. Then Pachori said that small islands like the Maldives were vulnerable to sea level rise. Well, no, they're not, because they're made of coral. The one kind of islands in the world that are never vulnerable to sea level ri rise are coral islands, because coral is a living organism, and the time when it grows fastest is when the sea level rises and it grows to meet the light, and it can outgrow any foreseeable rate of sea level rise. Corals have been around for 550 million years. They're not going anywhere in a hurry. If sea level were to rise, then up come the corals to match them. A paper just last week, as I record this, has actually measured this effect in the increase in the size of various Pacific atolls in areas where there has been a little bit of sea level rise over the last 30 or 40 years, and the corals are simply rising to meet the new level of the sea, which is, after all, why, not by coincidence, all the Pacific atolls are at or more or less above, just a little bit above sea level, after 11,400 years, and in those 11,400 years, 130 metres or 400 feet of sea level rise. It's not just by accident that after all that going on uh, over the last 11,400 years, somehow all atolls are exactly at sea level. They're at sea level because that's where the corals grow to as the sea level rises. That's where they have grown to as the sea level has risen. That's where they will grow to as the sea level will rise. So then Pachori goes on and on a long list of further mistakes. He was saying that by 2100, 100 million people would be displaced by rising sea levels. And where does he get that figure from? Well, I'll tell you, it's from Al Gore's movie. There's no scientific basis for that whatsoever. But it is the figure you'll find in Al Gore's movie. Then he said he'd seen for himself, this railroad engineer had seen for himself the damage done in Bangladesh by sea level rise. 
So, in preparing for this talk I'm giving now, I consulted Professor Niklas Myrna, who has written 530 papers in the scientific literature, probably a record for any scientist, all of them peer-reviewed, most of them about sea level rise. He is Mr. Sea Level Rise. He knows more about it than anybody else on the planet. And what he says is that he's just been to Bangladesh and he went with a group of climate scientists, only one who correctly calibrated his altimeter to work out exactly what height he was at, was Nicholas Myrna, who knows that you have to take two readings at least 10 meters apart when you arrive at your destination to make sure that the instrument is calibrated before you begin using it. Once he'd calibrated it, he began using it and did his characteristically meticulous measurements and found that sea level in Bangladesh had actually fallen. And what Pachori had been shown was coastal erosion in the Sundarban Peninsula. And the reason why there's been erosion there is that 90% of the mangroves that used to protect the coastline there, natural growths that protect the, the, the coastline, have been cut away to make way for shrimp farms. And the mangroves are no longer holding the coast together, and it is eroding away simply as the tides go in and out. Nothing whatever to do with global warming. And so then Pachori says, well, we can't even afford to delay reducing emis carbon emissions by as much as a year. So here's a useful equation that you might like to uh, use when trying to work this out for yourself. The amount of warming that is caused by a given increase in CO2 concentration using the central estimate that the UN itself uses, I've simply simplified their equations, but it gives them their answer, is this. You, you just say that the amount of warming you get is 4.7 times the natural or Napierian logarithm, usually called these days just the logarithm, of the proportionate increase in CO2 concentration. Let's take an example. Today we have 388 parts per million of CO2 in the atmosphere. Now Pachori says we can't even wait a year, because in one year we will have added how much? Another two parts per million. We're adding exactly two parts per million per year. We have been for the whole of the last decade, completely straight line. So, 390 parts per million it would be next year if we did nothing. So now we say 4.7 times the logarithm of 390 over 388. And what's the answer? You can do it in your head. It is 0 0.024 Celsius. So the idea that we, ha we can't even wait a year has absolutely no scientific foundation whatsoever. And so he then says, well, solar and wind power provided more jobs per million invested than coal. Well, maybe they do, but that's a measure of their relative inefficiency, the correct policy and one which somebody who comes from a third world country would surely have advocated, would be to raise the standard of living of the poorest by letting them burn as much fossil fuels as they need to, to get electricity, which is the fastest, cheapest, most certain way of lifting them out of poverty, stabilizing their populations, and hence, in the long run, reducing the total environmental impact of humankind. That's the correct policy, and anything else is organized cruelty. Thank you.